Hello, and welcome to the seventh annual Scholars Week Speech Contest, sponsored by the Department of Communication Studies, the College of Liberal Arts, and McGraw-Hill. My name is Natanya Lissash, and I am the Speech Contest Chair. While our contest looks a bit different this year, our goal remains the same, giving you, our students, a chance to showcase the skills you've learned in our Fundamentals of Communication class. This contest is open to anyone who has taken COM 2200 at Middle Tennessee State University, so feel free to dust off your persuasive speeches and enter them in next year's contest. This year, we've added another prize, a Viewer's Choice Award. At the end of this video, you'll find information on how to vote for your favorite speaker. Both the speech contest winner and the viewer's choice winner will be announced on the speech contest website on Monday, April 19th. Thanks for watching and enjoy the presentations. Every two seconds, someone in the United States needs blood. The blood supply in hospitals is constantly experiencing shortages, but with the COVID-19 pandemic, the need for blood has skyrocketed. Voluntary blood donations are the only source of blood for hospitals across the nation. As a regular blood donor with family members who have needed a blood transfusion, a blood drive coordinator at my workplace, and through research on this topic, I have come to find how important it is for blood to be readily available in hospitals. Today, we'll take a look at the problem of the blood supply shortage in the United States, what's causing it, and how and why we should help. Let's take a look at the problem. There is currently a critical shortage in the blood supply across, in hospitals across the United States. Cancer patients, victims of car crashes, and surgical patients, including babies, are only some of the many people that could require a blood transfusion at any given moment. According to CNN's Shelby Erdman and Jamie Gumbricht, the blood supply shortages are so bad, they prompted the FDA to revise their deferral period from 12 months to three months for certain donors. Some of those donors could be people that have recently gotten tattoos or maybe traveled to a country where malaria exposure is a risk. Now, now that you know about the problem, let's look at what's causing it. The COVID-19 pandemic has triggered an unprecedented amount of blood drive cancellations. According to the American Red Cross, more than 80% of the blood they collect comes from drives held at places such as churches and schools and workplaces. So the cancellations that have resulted from this pandemic have cut down the number of donations by 86,000 since the month of March. Another factor that causes a shortage in the blood supply is the lack of donors. Volunteer donors are the only source of blood for hospitals across the United States. So the less people that donate, the less lives that can be saved. According to blooddrivesafety.com, some of the most common reasons people give for not donating are fear of needles or they think that people already give enough, or they think that giving once a year is sufficient. Now, let's look at how and why we can help. Becoming a regular blood donor is the only way in which we can help alleviate this problem. An article on the University of Maryland Medical Center's website tells us that the average adult has 10 to 12 pints of blood. And when we donate one pint, our body can replenish that within 24 hours of our donation. One donation can save up to three lives. So when we donate one pint, just one pint, we can make a difference, a life or death difference in the life of someone. According to Erica Serino of Healthline.com, donors with blood type O are the most sought because they're considered universal donors meaning their blood can be matched with any of the four types, A, B, AB, and O. But regardless of your blood type, your donation is equally important and crucially, crucially needed. The blood donation process is simple. Anyone over the age of 17 who weighs 110 pounds or more can volunteer to donate. Donors must present valid ID and undergo a brief health screening 
The cumulative process lasts about an hour, but the actual donation part only lasts 10 to 15 minutes. Although donating blood is often associated with bruising and dizziness and other mild discomfort, there's actually several health benefits to donating blood regularly. Adrian Santos Longhurst of Healthline.com tells us that donating blood regularly may lower iron stores, which are known or believed to increase the risk of heart attack. When we donate blood, we also undergo a free health screening. Our blood pressure, hemoglobin level, blood, uh, weight, temperature, that's all checked. In addition, our blood is tested for hepatitis B and C, among other diseases. So, now that you know about this issue, it is important that you act. Anyone in the Middle Tennessee area who wishes to donate blood can visit the American Red Cross Blood Donation Center in Murfreesboro, or you can log on to redcrossblood.org and find your nearest blood drive. Roll up your sleeve and become a regular blood donor. And if you're hesitant about doing it, think about this. Your donation could help save someone's child, someone's spouse, someone's grandparent. Pay it forward because none of us know if tomorrow it'll be us or one of our loved ones laying in a hospital bed, praying that someone somewhere decided to be courageous and give a precious priceless gift, their blood. Thank you. Apples, oranges, blueberries, almonds. These are just a few of many foods that could soon disappear entirely. More than a third of all U.S. crops produced rely on pollinators, chiefly the honeybee. Today I'll tell you a little bit about the honeybee and the problems facing them, the consequences they're up against, and a little bit about how you can help them out of this bind that they're in. Ever since I was little, my family has run a small beekeeping operation, and since I could walk, I have been out in the bee yards and in the honey barn processing, and this year I have been put in charge of my family's honey operation. In addition to that, I will be citing sources such as Joe M. Graham's The Hive and the Honey Bee, considered to be a beekeeper's bible, John H. Lavelle's Honey Plants of North America, and Ross Conrad's Natural Beekeeping. To understand the threat and the gravity, we must first understand the context of beekeeping in today's world. Now, due to more globalization than ever, there are more diseases and pests facing honeybees than ever. Not the least among these is the many mites that they're up against. According to Keith S. Delaplane's book, Mites of the Honeybee, the worldwide dispersal of mites continues to be one of the most serious problems facing beekeeping today. One of these, the tracheal mite, latches on to, as the name suggests, the bee's trachea and draws the blood from its host, slowly killing it. Another and more lethal mite is the varroa mite, which sneaks in to the brood chamber while the bee is still developing and latches on. And as the bee gets born, after it has developed and crawls out, it has this mite already on it, infected, basically, helping to populate the hive full of varroa mites. According to the hive and the honeybee, varroa mites continue to be one of the most vexing problems for beekeepers today. Another deceptively dangerous enemy of the honeybee is the hive beetle. Hive beetles make use of excess real estate in the hive, and they uh, plant their eggs and their larvae, eat through honey, pollen, and even bee larvae. Bees have their work cut out for them. But the scariest enemy, perhaps, is diseases. There's a host of diseases that threaten beekeeping today. The most lethal of these is a bacterial infection called American fowl brood, which according to Ross Conrad's book, Natural Beekeeping, attacks larvae in its developing stages and turns this larvae into a goo that drips down to the bottom of the hive. For comparison, this is a healthy chunk of honeycomb I cut from one of our hives. And this is a picture of honeycomb infected with American fowl brood, or AFB. The larvae is dead, it's soaking wet, and it stinks. Another infection, which is, sounds similar but is functionally a little different than American fowl brood, is European fowl brood. According to Australia's Be Aware organization, European fowl brood, or EFB, attacks the larval food supply. So essentially they run out of baby food and the new generations of bees just die out entirely. In addition to diseases and pests, 
the bees have to face mankind. The majority of beekeeping takes place in rural areas, and in rural areas, farming is common. Agricultural pesticides often used can spread through pollen to beehives. According to a National Pesticide Information Center's article on the subject, the poison, the pesticide, can be spread into the pollen and flower of the plant, and when the bee lands to pollinate, it picks up this pollen and carries this infected pollen back to its hive. In sufficient quantities, it can lead to erratic behavior, paralysis, or even hive death. So, the bees are up against a wall. How can we help them? For starters, you can plant natural forages or homeopathics. If you plant forages for livestock or have herb gardens, you might already plant something that's good for bees. Crimson clover, white clover, sweet clover, alfalfa, and buckwheat, these are all excellent honey crops and forages. If you have an herb garden, you might consider planting some catnip, mint, sage, or bee balm. These all provide excellent nectar sources for bees. In addition, you can buy from your local farmer's market. It may cost a little extra, but anybody who has tasted the difference between a hothouse tomato and a homegrown tomato can tell you that it is well worth the extra few dollars spent to get the good stuff. So you may say, okay, I can plant those homeopathics, I can plant forages, and I can even buy from the farmer's market. But how do I really help the bees? How do I ensure that they continue and really make a difference? Well, the truth is, if you'll allow me to be perfectly frank with you, that in this situation, like so many others, you speak the loudest with your money. Farmers are excellent, hardworking people, but they do have families to feed. Right now, it's not profitable to grow organically. It's a niche market still. Although, according to Ross Conrad's Natural Beekeeping, organic farming has been the largest growing sector of the U.S. food industry for well over a decade now. So it's starting, but it's not there yet. They still need your help. If more money is put into organic farming practices, and if there's more demand, more farmers will do it because it'll be more profitable. And soon the price will go down. So that's a way you can help is to continue to support organic farming by talking with your money. For farmers to do this in earnest, it must be profitable for them to do so, and that's how you achieve that. If these threats continue to go unchecked, the, re the results could be disastrous. As mentioned earlier, more than a third of all U.S. crops rely on these pollinators. If the pollinators go away, the crops go away. So, they're relying on us, and you can make much more of an impact than you think you can. So, to wrap up, this coming spring, if you plant forages or homeopathics, why don't you plant nectar-rich forages and grasses to help your local bee populations and give them a source of clean nectar besides the other more large-scale agricultural sources. In addition, this coming spring and summer, buy from your local farmer's market. As I said earlier, it might be a little bit extra, but... When you go to your local farmer's market, you get to meet the people who grow your food, and you get to enjoy being able to shake the hand of the person who produced what you're buying. If we all do a little bit, we can ensure that the honeybee continues to grow and thrive, and we can ensure a steady supply of Tennessee natural organic honey, which I promise you is a worthwhile and very rewarding cause. Thank you. Between the years of 2009 to 2017, there was a 110% increase in suicide rates among females ages 10 to 19. Teens feel more pressure and anxiety than ever before. Teens feel more sad, less like they fit in, and more unhappy with their appearance. In fact, the Addiction Center says that Gen Z is the loneliest generation in America. What could be causing this? Drugs? No. Alcohol? No. Coronavirus? While it certainly feels like it, no. Social media is causing this. As previously mentioned in my last speech, I work at Tractor Supply Company as a social media support specialist. My job is working on social media, but as a teen and a student, I feel the effects of social media on my mental health every day. And so I think it is compulsory that I share how social media not just affects us as college students or as people, but as a society. And so that is why I chose to speak about social media and why we should use it less. 
What are some of the problems with social media? Well, according to the CDC and a Netflix documentary, The Social Dilemma, suicide rates have grown at a steady rate ever since 2009 with the emergence of mobile social media. In fact, in 2018 alone, over 6,000 young people between the ages of 10 and 24 committed suicide. This is significant because some of these may have been avoided had they used social media less. Another issue is during one's middle school years, fitting in and feeling good can be one of the most important aspects of that person's life at that moment. It is normal for individuals in this age range to feel like they don't fit in. However, the use of social media can exacerbate these feelings of not fitting in and not feeling good. In 2012, the Gothenburg Research Institute conducted a survey that found that females that use Facebook are more likely to be less happy and have lower self-esteem than those that do not use Facebook. So middle school age kids had these feelings amplified by social media. And lastly, Gen Z, my generation, is the loneliest generation in America. According to Cigna, a health insurance company, America is currently facing a loneliness epidemic. A whopping 50% of all surveyed say they have feelings of isolation and loneliness on a regular basis. So you get it. There are some big problems with social media. But what specifically is causing these problems? Why are teens committing suicide over social media? Well, it's a combination of all the previous feelings I mentioned. Feelings of loneliness and isolation. Feelings of unhappiness, low self-esteem. But there's one key ingredient that I'm missing, and that is cyberbullying. Social media allows bullies to bully easier than ever before. According to cyberbullying.com, 36.5% of people say they have been cyberbullied in their lifetime, but yet 87% of all young adults say they have seen cyberbullying occur before. If a person is already experiencing the negative effects of social media and they become cyberbullied, it can be a disastrous and sometimes fatal recipe. Why do we feel worse when we use social media? Well, according to Psychology Today, there isn't a great answer to that question. Some experts think that people with low self-esteem begin to use social media and just simply never get better. Other experts think that we as humans compare each other on social media. And when somebody looks good, we feel bad. What is definitely known, however, is that High social media use is linked to lower self-esteem and lower happiness. And lastly, why are we lonelier than ever before? According to the Addiction Center, Gen Z millennials use social media more than any other generation. Experts think that the fake versions of ourselves that we put on social media make it hard to have real connections with others. Others, Other experts think that the lack of face-to-face -face interaction makes it difficult to have meaningful connection even if you engaged in meaningful conversation on social media. So now you understand why teens may commit suicide over social media, why we feel worse when using social media, and why we are lonelier than ever. But what can we do to solve this? Unfortunately, there's not many studies that say what we can do to solve this. However, by simply looking at these studies, we can infer that the less you use social media, the more likely you are to be happier and boost your self-esteem. According to Psychology Today, heavy users of social media are twice as likely to report social isolation. Going back to the Gothenburg Research Institute, they found that female users that use Facebook have lower happiness and less self-esteem. So it can be inferred by simply looking at these studies, we can boost our happiness and our self-esteem by limiting our time on social media. And for those that are cyberbullied, it can reduce the amount of cyberbullying they are exposed to. So what is the big picture here? The big picture here is that teens feel worse about themselves than ever before. Teens are killing themselves more than ever before. And we as a society are beginning to lack meaningful interaction, creating a loneliness epidemic. So how can we fix this? We can fix this by turning off our phones, closing your computers, and refusing to click on that notification. If we reduce the amount of time we are on social media, the happier we will be and the higher self-esteem we will have. So, as always, I leave you with this closing remark. 
Mother Teresa once said, the greatest poverty is loneliness. So shut off your phone and go talk to someone. You'd be doing yourself a favor, and who knows, you might be doing them an even bigger favor. President Franklin D. Roosevelt once said, no business which depends for existence on paying less than living wages to its workers has any right to exist in this country. From its early beginnings, the federal minimum wage was created in good faith to help meet the financial needs of the American people. In the most recent years though, it has been proven that the current minimum wage is not a livable salary for most Americans. As a student studying finance, I've had the opportunity to extensively study the nation's workers and economy. I've also had the opportunity to do additional research from various sources on the minimum wage, such as the Pew Research Center, the Center for Economic and Policy Research, and the Economic Policy Institute. First, let's start with the issues related to the current minimum wage. The current minimum wage is not at an adequate standard of living. A full-time worker making the minimum wage earns about $15,080. This is below the federal poverty line for families of two or more, according to the Economic Policy Institute. This means that a single parent would have trouble making ends meet for their child, especially if they had more than one. Due to inflation, the purchasing power of the minimum wage has also gone down significantly. According to Pew Research Center, since 2009, when the minimum wage was increased to $7.25, the minimum wage has lost 9.6% of its purchasing power. Even worse, a 2017 Bureau of Labor Statistics report revealed that 1.3 million people in the United States make below the federal minimum wage, which means they have even less purchasing power and less opportunities to have a standard living. As a result of these issues, workers are less motivated and they have trouble making ends meet for their families. Now that we understand some of the issues, let's discuss some of the solutions that we can have. The federal minimum wage should gradually be increased to an adequate standard wage. Raising the minimum wage would help reduce poverty. Additional income would allow workers to make the necessary purchases they need in order to provide an adequate standard of living for their families. Additionally, higher wages would allow low-income workers to rely less on government services like food stamps or public housing. In relation to worker motivation, an article by the Education and Labor Committee stated that researchers and economists tend to agree that higher wages lead to higher production and less employee turnover. Even more proof that a higher minimum wage is necessary. Ben Zipper, an economist at the Economic Policy Institute, stated the following. Soon, workers in every region of the country will soon need $15 per hour to maintain a modest but adequate standard of living. For perspective, that's more than two times larger an amount than our current minimum wage. Now that we see a solution, let's discuss how this solution will help us in the future. Raising the minimum wage will have a positive effect on our future. Higher wages would lead to an increase in consumer spending, which would benefit everyone. It would help the workers that are earning more wages and making more purchases in our businesses. And those businesses are what help our economy thrive. States and cities that have already enacted minimum wages higher than the federal amount have already reaped the economic benefits of this change. For example, a study by researchers at UC Berkeley showed that the food industry services in six cities that raise their minimum wage above the federal level have seen increased earnings for workers and no significant job loss. While this is a small sample, it does give us insight into what it would be like to raise a minimum wage above the federal level. If the minimum wage is not increased, more families will be left behind in poverty, and ultimately they will continue to suffer economically. Now that you see the positive change that this 
increase in wages could have. Let me explain to you how you can help make this a reality. If you believe as strongly as I do that the minimum wage should be increased to an adequate standard living wage, then I encourage you to contact your local representatives and voice your concerns. A local representative of our area is Mr. Scott Desjardins. He represents the 4th District of Tennessee, which includes Rutherford County. In order to voice your concerns, you can find all of his contact information at desjardins.house.gov. If we continue on our current path and don't change the current minimum wage, more Americans will be left behind in poverty. I urge you to contact your local representatives and voice your concerns so that not only can we create a better future for some Americans, but for all. Thank you. Dear MTSU community, going from home to downtown for work, to the supermarket for groceries, or to the beach for a weekend trip, this simple act of moving from point A to point B is one we replicate thousands of times over the course of our lives. And in the overwhelming majority of these times, only one mode of transportation is used, driving a car. It's become enshrined in American culture, inspiring countless songs and movies, rushing every teenager to the DMV right after their 16th birthday, and ultimately symbolizing American freedom. But it's time for the tide to turn. We need to stop the glorification of car culture. Today we will examine how cars are environmentally wasteful, cause debts, and isolate the driver. Now that we've introduced the subject, let's take a closer look at how cars are environmentally wasteful. Due to the inherent inefficiencies of the modern internal combustion engine, less than 30% of energy derived from fuel is used to actually push the car down the road. According to a 2018 report by the U.S. Department of Energy, while cars are spewing all that fuel, they're releasing toxins and particulate matter into the air that induce asthma, lung disease, and cancer. They also cause 53,000 premature deaths per year, according to a 2013 study by Dr. Stephen Barrett with MIT. The reason this happens is we purchase vehicles that are overbuilt for what we actually use them for. And David Humes, a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist who covers the environment and sustainability, on this subject wrote, we drive 4,000 pound vehicles that are built for five people and eight suitcases, and most of the time, it's just one person going to work. This is transportation overkill. Now that we've seen how cars waste environmental resources, let's take a look at how cars waste the most precious resource, human lives. Cars that weigh 4,000 pounds and are capable of driving over 120 miles an hour are killing machines. In fact, over 50,000 Americans are killed each year, making it the leading cause of death for young people aged 1 to 39, according to a 2012 report by the U.S. Department of Transportation. But it wasn't always this way. According to historian Peter Norton with the University of Virginia, in the early 20th century, when the car came about as a brand new invention, it was treated as a nuisance. And every time a car hit a pedestrian, 
he was met with fierce public backlash. This is because the streets used to belong to the people, and kids played in it all the time. But the automobile industry didn't like that, so they banded together and sought to wage a campaign to reshape public perception and have the public view the streets as something that belonged to the cars, not the people. So they used tactics like inventing the term jaywalker as an insult for anyone who crosses the street where they believe the cars belonged. And they won. These negative attitudes linger with us today. And the public is apathetic about people being killed by cars, even though they involve someone who simply just wanted to go for a walk and then having their kick, their teeth kicked to the back of their skull because they were plowed by a speeding car. We need to stop worshipping cars. My final point is that cars isolate the driver. Even if you drive them responsibly, you're still trapped in a metal box. And while driving, our main objective is to look forward straight at the road, and you don't look at any of the cars or objects in your periphery that much. So it's like tunnel vision. As a result, it's possible to pass by thousands of people in their own cars and not see any one of them. I care about you all, but it's not enough to just say that, I have to prove it. And it's my life's mission to prove it to every living soul. A great way to prove that I care about you all is to simply acknowledge your presence. Something simple like saying hi or waving, instead of just passing by you like you're a ghost. So, the idea to me that I can pass by thousands of people in their cars and not reach a single one of them devastates me. If I try waving at oncoming traffic, nobody's going to see me because they're looking straight at the road. All I want to do is show that I care about you all, and driving cars makes it an uphill battle. Now I will recap. We need to stop the glorification of car culture. They are environmentally harmful kill people, and isolate the driver. Over 53,000 people die each year prematurely from the emissions cars release, according to a 2013 study by Dr. Stephen Barrett with MIT. They're the leading cause of death for young people aged 1 to 39, according to a 2012 report by the U.S. Department of Transportation. And I can't show that I care about you all if you're trapped in a metal box. I'm not saying that you need to spend $30,000 on an electric car. I'm also not saying that you need to start walking 30 miles to work every day. All I'm saying is it's time we started having an honest conversation about how cars are far from perfect because this has been a problem for decades and I'm not hearing anyone talk about it. Hello, MTSU students, prospective students, parents, and communication enthusiasts. I am Dr. Roberta Chevret. I'm a faculty member in communication studies and women's and gender studies here at MTSU.
I'm here to tell you a little bit about the major in communication with a concentration in culture and social influence. The study of culture and social influence emphasizes communication skills that will help students make a difference in their careers, their personal lives, and their communities. This concentration also allows flexibility in areas of emphasis, providing students with options to analyze varying perceptions and values in courses dedicated to the study of intercultural communication, gender, sexuality, and diversity to develop rhetorical skills in courses about persuasion, rhetoric, and media, and to deepen their understanding of personal relationships in courses like romantic relationship communication, conflict in communication, lying and deception, and the dark side. Because communication is a top sought after skill by many employers, the degree offers entry into a wide range of careers, while also preparing students for graduate studies, community service endeavors, and personal development and growth. Please check out our courses and feel free to email me with any questions. Thank you. Hey everybody, I'm Dr. Betsy Dalton from the Department of Communication Studies. Um, if you're not sure what health communication is, I'll tell you a little bit about this newly launched concentration within our communication studies major. So health communication is focused on people's communication related behaviors pertaining to health, illness, wellness, as well as the impact of messages. So say messages from the doctor, the media, the internet on people's health behaviors and outcomes. I like to explain it to people as, um, you know, I study how people talk about health and then how that talk both reflects and creates reality. So we examine all of these things within close relationships, in organizational life, between patients and providers, um, in how we interact with online health information, and how we construct messages to best help people maintain health and well being and respond appropriately to risks. So this is a really great major for anyone who might be interested in becoming a um, communication professional in a health organization or is just otherwise interested in the health field, but maybe not as a direct care provider. So in terms of minoring and electives, these courses are also really great complements for students who are going into the health field as care providers, such as nursing students, um, those in uh, pre-professional health sciences or studying public health. And feel that some social science background, um, in addition to what they're doing, would round out their educational experience. So if you're interested and you want to come test it out, we're offering an on-ground intro to health comm course this fall, as well as a course on health risk communication and a health communication theory class as well. Um, so future courses will um, include patient provider communication, organizational health communication, um, let's see, health communication and technology and social media, and a variety of other options. So check with your advisor, come try out the intro course if you're interested, and we hope to see you in class. Hi, everybody. I'm Dr. Janet McCormick. After earning my PhD and teaching in London, Buenos Aires, and Singapore, I was hired by MTSU in 2002 to help grow the program in organizational communication, or ORCO, and I've loved every minute of it. Students drawn to the ORCO concentration are those who are focused on succeeding in organizational life in a multitude of careers by being confident, effective communicators. The ORCO concentration is composed of exciting, practical, career-oriented courses, both on-ground and online, in such topics as listening, interviewing, team or group work, training, consulting, auditing, leadership, and much more. Almost all of our courses include hands-on or experiential learning opportunities in preparation for profit or nonprofit work in a global workforce. Our alumni network is strong and active on social media and in the community. 
In fact, they're seeking you as interns, volunteers, and even future colleagues. Orco faculty are knowledgeable, experienced, outgoing, and excited to work with students just like you. Think about making a difference locally, regionally, nationally, and internationally. Think about ORCO. Check out our website and send me an email. I look forward to hearing from you.